Genesis chapter 18, verses 18 to 20, it says that God revealed that secret that he was going to destroy Sodom and Gomorrah to Abraham. And Abraham knows about Sodom and Gomorrah, that the twin cities are full of wickedness. He knows that too well. But at the same time, he also knows that his nephew, Lot, is living in Sodom and Gomorrah. So he interceded. See, he received a revelation. He did not side with God. He did not align himself with God and say, Yes, Lord, those Sodomites, those Gomorrah heights, they deserve to be destroyed. Why are you still waiting? Why send two emissaries? Destroy them right now. You said that you heard them, the cries. So why send an emissary? He did not do that. The Bible says, and Noah and Abraham stopped and turned and looked at God. And the Bible also says, after God spoke with Abraham, he stopped and looked at Abraham. And if you look at several other translations in the Hebrew, this is the picture it conveys. And I dig deep into it. And I found that after God revealed that to Abraham, God did not just walk away. He stood there expecting Abraham to do something. He waited, you know, God waited. And Abraham just looked at God. And when he saw the face of God, in the eyes of God, come on Abraham, do something. I'm waiting. He understood that. You know why he understood that? Because Abraham had an intimate relationship with God. He had an intimate walk with God. Because he had an intimate walk with God, when he looked at the face of God, he understood what the eyes of God were conveying to him. He just understood. The burden of God was transferred to Abraham. Abraham received the burden. He was not like a man who looked at the mirror and just walked away forgetting how he looked like. He looked at the mirror and he stand and he looked again. That's what Abraham did. And then he pleaded with God. Lord, how can you do this? You are a good God. You are a kind God. What if there are 50 righteous people? Will you destroy this entire two cities for the sake of 50 righteous people? God said, no, Abraham, because you are my dear friend. Because you ask, I will do this for you. No, I will not destroy it. As soon as God said that, Abraham felt bold. And just as the Lord was about to go, he pulled God. He said, Lord, wait a minute. Don't go yet. What if there were 45? Okay, Abraham, for your sake, I will not destroy. Really? What if there were 40? Then he went down the list. And he came to 10. You know why he stopped at 10? Because there were 10 members in Lot's family. There were 10 members in Lot's family. So Abraham stopped at 10. He was 100% sure that his good nephew, his righteous nephew, had commanded his family well to walk after God. That was what God spoke of Abraham. He said, I know him. He will command his family well before me. That was a statement God gave about Abraham. So Abraham expected Lord to be like him. That he had commanded his family well. That there were ten righteous people. His daughters, his son-in-laws, his wife, ten members. Because of their righteousness, Abraham was overly confident that they will be spared. So, and God knew there were not ten righteous people. So, in the past, God just waited and lingered to hear his conversation, his intercession. But when he reached ten, before he could go down to five, the Lord just walked away. He just walked away.
Now eventually, Sodom and Gomorrah was destroyed. But the Bible says in Genesis chapter 19, verses 16 and 29, and God remembered Abraham. Because there were no ten righteous people, the entire twin cities have to be destroyed, including Lot and his family. They were to be burned to ashes under the Dead Sea till today. At that moment, God remembered the intercession of Abraham. See, this is what I told you earlier. You cannot prevent a judgment, you can minimize its impacts. Save some people. Your prayers can save some people. Your prayers can save your family. The Bible says, you know, in Acts chapter 16 verse 31, Believe on the Lord Jesus, you and your household shall be saved. You and your household shall be saved. How can that promise go wrong? When I pray for families, I always claim that promise. I said, Lord, you promise this. Your word can never go wrong. You said, my household. So they and their household, whether their household believes or not, doesn't matter, Lord. Your word says they shall be saved. So therefore, you are bound by your word to save them. By hook or by crook? Save them, Lord. And you know, that's exactly what happened in Sodom that day. Loth, his wife, and his two daughters, they were still lingering whether to believe or not to believe. And the Bible says the angels grabbed the hands of Loth, his wife, and his two daughters, and literally dragged them out of the city. They said, unless and until you get out, we cannot destroy the city. Get out! See, what does it mean? Because of one righteous man standing in the gap, lifting up his hands, because of one man, judgment can be stopped. So if God determined a judgment to come, he will first get rid of this righteous people. Come on, you get out. Don't stand there. If you are there, I cannot do anything. Get out! Get out of my way. Right? That's what the scripture says, right? So, the angels literally dragged the four of them out of the cities. Saved them. So, when you receive a revelation, we should pray. Thirdly, the judgment upon Israel was revealed to Moses. Exodus chapter 32, verses 9 to 10. Now when Moses himself was sick and tired, fed up with these three million Israelites who were totally ungrateful, obstinate, stubborn, and ungrateful. They were complaining, murmuring. You know, they were slaves for 400 years. Now they were out of Egypt, free people. Instead of appreciating their freedom, they were complaining, grumbling, murmuring. They said, you know, our life was so much better in Egypt. We were eating garlic, we were having garlic bread, we were having garlic pizza. Why you brought out into the wilderness? Now we are looking at nothing. Let us go back to Egypt. Moses was up to... His patience was over his head, you know. That is why he lost his cool many times. Cool Moses was no more cool. <laughs> when you have a church of three million complainers, grumblers, and murmurers, do you think you'll, you will be very patient with them? Mr. Cool or Miss Cool will not be uncool. But... Look what Moses did. He knelt down, took hold of the hands of God, said, Lord, how can you do this? 
what will the nation say? That you brought those people out of Egypt only to kill them in the wilderness. What will happen to your name? But beyond that, remember the promise you made to Abraham. He reminded God of his word, of his covenant. He interceded. So much so that God had to tell Abraham, let my hand go. Let me destroy these people. Don't hold my hand. Moses held the hand of God and prevented God from destroying the people. That is intercession. And when God wouldn't, still wouldn't listen, Abraham pulled out his wild cart. And he said, Lord, if you still want to kill them, then blot my name out of the book of life. Blot me out. How many of you will do that? You won't do that, you know. I do not know whether I will do it. You asking God, Lord, strike my name out of the book of life if you will not spare Houston. How many of you will do that? See, not a single hand goes up. But look at Moses. He said, if you want to kill them, strike my name out of the book of life. I don't want to enter into heaven. I don't want to enter into the promised land. Strike me out. And that moved God. What great love. Great love that a man was willing to lay down his life for his brethren. Greater love hath no man than this. See, the golden rule of divine love was exhibited by Moses. God is looking for such intercessors today. If there are such intercessors today who stand in the gap and hold the hands of God, true intercessors like Moses, many, many judgments over the nations will never come, will never come to pass. You know, that kind of intercession is one that is born out of sacrificial love. The divine love, the love that is from the heart of the Lord Jesus, that goes beyond. See, the moment you are willing to say, Lord, strike my name out of the book of life, you, you know what it means? You have crucified yourself. You, are, you have died to a self-centered life. You have broken through. The corn has fallen to the ground. The corn has died. Now you will spring forth many, many sons of righteousness. That's when you can truly say, it's no longer I that liveth, but Christ Jesus lives in me. Galatians 2.20 That is a true life, the true Christian life that is so pure, so clean, so holy, without any leaven. That is the goal, which is not an impossibility. The Apostle Paul, a man whose like passions like us, he attained that. If he could, any one of us could. Amen? If we could not, it would not be in the Bible. It would not be in the Bible because it is exclusively only for Paul. It would not have been written. But because it is written, it is possible for all of us to live that crucified life. You love others more than you love yourselves. That is true intercession. Whether you like Obama or you don't like Obama, that doesn't matter. When you're motivated by the love of God, you want to fall down on your knees, stand in the gap and cry out to God. There are some Americans I found, they don't even like America. 
these are the overly righteous zealots found in the Christian church today. Overly righteous. They have a pharisical righteous attitude within themselves. Oh yeah, America needs to be judged. America this, America that. Yeah, Los Angeles should go down the drain. Yeah, let it split up. Give it, give it into the ocean. Yeah, let the red metric for split up the nation, continent into two. These are the overly righteous people. And sadly, they consist of a large number in the church today. That is the reason why your nation, instead of being safe, is going further down into damnation. Sometimes I used to wonder, you know, with all this prayer movement going on there, prayer movement going on here, Lord, why, why is still all this is happening? Let me give you an example. In the year 2004, I was speaking at a prayer conference in Taiwan. And one day, an angel of the Lord came to me and gave me a word for Taiwan and asked the people to pray. So there were about 1,000 believers. You know, I tell you one truth. Nobody can pray like the Chinese people. When they pray, heavens will move. Mountains will move. The Chinese are great champions of prayers. So, when I gave the altar call, 1,000 people came running to the altar and they fell on their face and they were beating on their chest and they were banging their head on the floor. They were weeping and they were crying and mucus were flowing all from their nose and this, and the whole auditorium was reverberating, shaking and moving with their cries and their prayers. This went on for 45 minutes. I was standing in one corner, I was amazed, oh my God. We thought the Indians are great champions of prayer. I had to change my opinion when I saw the Chinese people. Oh my God, look at them. So, 45 minutes of intense praying, intense banging their head on the floor, hitting their chests and crying out to God. And towards the end of the 45 minutes, an angel appeared with a bowl in his hand. And he told me, these prayers are not enough. I said, you must be kidding. <laughs> of course, even when I say like that, I say with respect, you know. <laughs> I said, 45 minutes of praying and you say this is not enough? Then the angel told me, come, take a look at this bowl. And I looked into the bowl. This was a huge bowl. And there was only a small, very thin layer of a liquid at the very bottom of the bowl. So I asked the angel, what is that? Those are all the tears that these people have prayed. I said, this much? Please don't laugh. This is serious. Because you are no better than them. So only very low level of tears. I said, how can that be? They have cried for 45 minutes. That's when he said to me, it's not how much you cry, but how you cry. It's not how much Quantity matters, but also quality is supreme. Were you on your face because everybody else was on your face? Were you just bowing down your head because everybody else was bowing down? Or were you really tearing your heart and crying out to God? That tears represented the amount of people who really tore their heart. And with great love, sacrificial love, they prayed to God. The rest of them went through a religious ceremony like we all do in our churches. When we call for a prayer meeting, everybody, well, not everybody comes, a handful comes. When the pastor says, let's pray, 
everybody keep quiet. Right? Everybody keep quiet, waiting for somebody to pray. And eventually when someone prays, the rest of them are still very quiet. They say, yes, Lord. Amen. Yes, Lord. See, you don't pray, but you're just nodding your head in agreement. That amounts to nothing. This is the problem we have now. This is a problem. So when God sees such hypocrisy, even among informed people, even among those who claim to seek God, if only hypocrisy can be found, who's going to save the nation? How's the nation going to be saved? When states after states started passing on the same-sex marriage bill, what did you do? What did you do? You just hope that it doesn't happen in your state. But if the entire nation had done something, the Supreme Court would not have passed the bill yesterday. There would be righteous judges on the bench not liberals, not gays who are judges on the bench. But because you did nothing, the scripture says now, God looks for one man, like Moses, stand in the gap, will take hold of God and cry out to God, no Lord, I will not allow that. One man stood for three million people. Right, John? And there's the same scripture that says in Ezekiel, I look for one man, one man. Now, whenever I look at the scripture, I always used to wonder, you know, if one man is all enough, but why is it that when a, a bunch of people are praying and God doesn't hear? I had this question in my heart. Today I have an answer. That bunch of people are not praying sacrificially like how Moses prayed. They pray. Still, it was a self-centered prayer. It was not a sacrificial prayer. It was not like how Moses prayed, Lord, take my life. Spare my nation, Lord. If you will not spare my nation, take my life. I don't want heaven. How many dare? How many dare? is that one man, that one man who was willing to lay down his life. It took one man, you know, to die on the cross. So many people were, were hanging on the cross. So many people during the Roman reign were crucified on the cross. But there was one man who brought salvation. The rest all died for themselves. But the Lord Jesus died for you. He didn't die for himself. He denied his life like Moses. He denied himself and died for you. That made a whole lot of difference, you know. And that brought salvation. That brought a revelation of God's love that none of the angels in heaven have ever seen before. That God loved these people so much that he was willing to come down to the earth, you know, forgo all the glories of heaven. In heaven, there's streets of gold. And everything is beautiful, holy in heaven. The Lord gave up that humbled himself like in fashion in sinful men. That was the first sacrifice he made, you know. Not that just dying on the cross. The dying on the cross was the last. The first was he took on flesh. He who cannot be seen took on flesh, which itself was death. Because this sinful flesh is prone to weakness, to sickness, to everything. 
fleshy. He had to overcome all his flesh, the passions. He overcome all that. He overcame all that. And then look at the rejection he went through. The people that he came to serve, the people he came to save, rejected him. That was another dying. Yet, he selflessly served them. He did not hold back. Okay, you don't believe me? Okay, I don't serve you anymore. I don't preach to you anymore. You can leave my church and go to another church. No, he still keep on serving them. Keep on praying for them. Keep on ministering to them. Ungrateful people. One saint in India once said like this, you know, serving God is serving ungrateful people. Right? Out of ten, one will be grateful. That's the ratio. The Lord Jesus himself had that problem. Ten were healed, only one came to say thank you. Sacrificial love. So do you love your nation so much that you are willing to stand in the gap and pray for your nation? Fourth, revelations concerning Jerusalem. If you read Matthew chapter 23, verses 37 to 39, the Lord Jesus Christ received a revelation about Jerusalem. He revealed what was going to happen to Jerusalem. He didn't stop there. He himself prayed for Jerusalem. Luke chapter 19, verses 41 to 44. And there were prophecies about the Messiah's coming first coming. So many prophecies were given all throughout the book of the Old Testament prophets. The Messiah's birth, where he will be born, his birth as a virgin, the city where he will be born, all were written. So what did the people do? Just waited for the Messiah to be born whenever he feels like being born? No. Two people interceded and prayed for the birthing of the Messiah. If you read Luke chapter 2, verses 36 to 38, it says that Anna, from the day she became a widow, young widow, for more than 60 years, she fasted and she prayed for the birthing of the Messiah. She never left the temple. She just stayed in a corner in the temple, 64 years, fasting and praying. Nobody can beat her record, you know. 64 years of fasting and praying for the birthing of the Messiah. Likewise, so many promises that God gives to you, for you, for your church, for your ministry. We don't just hope. If God gives you a promise, you know, many people come to me for prayer. They say, you know, God said that, God said this, how come it doesn't come to pass? So I always tell them, if God truly spoke, it will come to pass. If it's not coming to pass, it means God didn't speak. Or, if God truly spoke, then wait. Why are you rushing God? When God himself is so patient, why can't you? You know, last month, I went to Nigeria for a conference. The day that I set foot on Nigeria was a fulfillment of the word the Lord spoke to me 30 years ago. 30 years ago, when I was fasting for 40 days, I saw a map of Africa. And I saw two lights lighting up, one on the east and one on the west. And knowing the geography of Africa, Africa, I knew the light, the first light was in the east was Kenya, and the second light in the west was Nigeria. So, and the Lord said, I will take you to that nation. So, okay, Lord, I waited. In 1994, the Lord brought me to Kenya. So, the first part of the prophecy came to pass. And I waited, and I waited, and I waited. It didn't bother me how long I waited. 
But 30 years later, from the day that it was spoken, 30 years to the day, I stepped foot in Nigeria. So when God speaks, when he truly speaks, it will come to pass. You need not fret about it. Don't try to help God. If you try to help God, you will end up giving birth to Ishmael's. And Ishmael will come after you with a sword, like what they are doing today. One woman's costly mistake. One woman's costly mistake of a moment. For 4,000 years, the Ishmaelites are a thorn in Israel's flesh. How will God reveal his secrets? In Amos 3, 7 to 8, he said God will reveal the secrets. How will he reveal? Number one, he reveals these secrets to the prophets or through a word of prophecy. Or he may take you to heaven and you're part of the prophetic council. You hear what's been said. You read about that in 1 Kings chapter 22, verses 19 to 22. And 2 Chronicles chapter 18, verses 18 to 22. There is a council in heaven where God gathers his prophets and he reveals to them before he makes any plans. He shares his secrets with them. And Zechariah chapter 3, verse 7 to 8. And Habakkuk, um, Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1. It was like this in the year 2004. I was in St. Louis. And there was a great worship going on. And everybody was so lost in the worship. And I was speaking the that night, so I was praying and waiting on God. Suddenly, I saw the heavens opened. And I saw the Lord Jesus Christ seated at a round table, surrounded by many prophets, Old Testament prophets. And I heard their discussion. And the discussion was, the Lord was saying, USA's destiny will be decided very soon. Now, this was in 2004. Satan's